All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual here from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from Seattle by Nolan Bradbury. How are you doing, Nolan? I'm doing well. How are you? Excellent. And Nolan is the founder of Bradfield Accounting and Advisory and a seasoned financial professional who's passionate about helping business owners reach their dreams. He works to help founders and business owners minimize the unknown and remove operational uncertainty from the equation so they can concentrate on what they do best, lose less sleep, which is always good, and increase profitability and cash flow. I'm going to talk today about a couple of things around uh, around finance and, and accounting and the role that it really does play in maximizing in helping a, you know, a company's profitability and maximizing strategically how it can play a role. Because let's face it, I mean, Nolan, you work with a lot of entrepreneurs, right? And yeah. often out of the gate, maybe there's a lot of aspects of the financial part that maybe they're not as uh, tuned into. And and I think, uh, and you could tell, you could speak to this better than me, but running out of cash and runway is probably one of the things that afflicts people the most because it always kind of takes longer than we would expect and therefore yeah. managing. And the other part is, you know, revenue and cash flow aren't the same thing either. And, and, and just preparing yourself for these things that often kind of catch people out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, well, I'll start with by saying, I think one of the things that oftentimes gets entrepreneurs in trouble is their general dislike for finance and accounting, if I'm going to be honest with you. So, I mean, I think uh, they understand and recognize the importance of it, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that you're going to like spend a lot of the time you need on it. Just like we all know we should work out, but that doesn't mean we work out as much as we should. Right. Uh, and so when, when there's things that we dislike, we tend to avoid them. And so as a result, when you're sitting at the table and you're thinking about how am I going to spend my time and my resources on growing this business, it tends to shift more to things like how can I grow top line revenue? How can I focus on sales and marketing? Mm -hmm. And not that you shouldn't, right? But inherently in all of that is well, what are the numbers underneath all of those pieces really telling me? And I think that's oftentimes where entrepreneurs can get themselves in trouble is like sort of overlooking that component. Yeah. And and, and obviously, uh, you know, obviously you want to bring in as much revenue as, as possible and all of that. Yeah. But um, the efficiency side of it, and we tend to often set up our businesses to be very, very inefficient because we we get into we try to do too much and then we try to scale by people. Yeah. You know, so this is where this is where things get tricky, right? Or not tricky. We, we start to become more inefficient is we grow top line revenue but we did we don't understand the relationship between that revenue and how we're spending it all the time and then that leads to cash flow issues right so as you said up front there's a difference between profitability and or and and what your cash actually is on hand that's an oftentimes a misconception that people have is they look at their p l and they go hey i made a hundred thousand dollars this month why yeah. don't i have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank it's like one of the most common questions i get and it's like well first we need to understand where else is your cash going that you maybe aren't thinking about from a from an outflow standpoint, right? Um, but people-wise, as we scale, we want to, and especially when you're the entrepreneur, right? We want to solve in problems and take it off of our plate. So what do we do? We hire people to fill roles for us. Uh, the challenge is oftentimes though we fill those roles maybe prematurely, and so we're paying for something uh, before maybe we necessarily need it. And that in turn then becomes a cash flow issue, right? Because you don't have the top line growth there necessarily to substantiate the expense that you just put on the books. And these are not one-time expenses, right? When you hire someone, it's there until you let go of that person. And mm -hmm. so a uh, much bigger impact than say, if you you know went out and bought a new piece of equipment, that's kind of a one and done type thing. Yeah. And, and, part, and, and part of that too is the fact that, uh, as you said about, you know, hiring immediately hiring people is you often end up with people you've hired and then you don't really have a full time job for them for what you hired them for. And so you start giving them other things to do. And now you have somebody who's maybe good at a quarter of their job and not very good at the rest of it, rather than looking at maybe, uh, it, you know, scaling by technology, maybe using outside contractors, fractional resources, all of this. But, but because traditionally we do get hung up on just throwing people at things. Yeah, what you just said is 100% true. And we see it a lot, which is we hire maybe a bit prematurely. So then we have capacity and we think, oh, well, I'm paying this person, I better mm -hmm. get as much out of it as I can. And so then we start assigning them tasks and roles that are maybe outside of their skill set or outside of what we hired them for. And then 
we're frustrated oftentimes because we don't understand why they're not being successful at the jobs we've given them. And unfortunately, maybe 40% of what they're doing, we didn't hire them for in the first place. Mm -hmm. And and then there's also um, just in in business. So we always call about you know the the silent killers, like those hidden costs. It's like uh, you used to use this uh, analogy. It's like what what, what destroys? Uh, what's the biggest destroyer of homes in the U.S. every year? Most people would go like fire or flood or hurricane. You go no, it's termites. Nice. And yeah. the thing is. You, they're silent killers. They're there, you know, chipping away in the background. You don't know until the house falls down. And there's a lot of hidden, there's a lot of overlooked expenses in a business that can contribute to that. I mean, one of the classic ones is is just not, not accounting for time, like saying, oh, I'll just get Nolan to help me with this and not accounting for the fact that I'm actually taking your time away from something else. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's a great scenario, right? Or a great example, which is fundamentally you know, you have a finite amount of time. It's like the one resource you never get more of in life, yep. right? And so when you ask someone to do something, you are also inherently telling them not to do anything else. And I think that sometimes we, we don't realize that's what we're doing when we say that. So yes, someone may be sitting there and you say, okay, can you go pull this report or can you go do this research? That also means that now anything else that they otherwise would have spent time on or would have done, it's gone, right? Mm -hmm. And so you know, th those are real dangers in terms of uh, capacity, how they get eaten up. I think, you know, and maybe not necessarily a silent one, but I see this a lot with businesses. They start out is there's a bit of shiny object syndrome. So mm -hmm. like, you know, as an owner, you see this thing, you're like, Ooh, I like that. And you sort of, you dig into it a little bit, maybe you buy a software, maybe you buy a, you know, something like that. And then you've accumulated all of this sort of like monthly recurring expenses out there all the while not really maybe deploying all of them officially maybe they don't all play together nicely or maybe what i see a lot is as businesses scale and they're trying to get to like the next sort of goal or plateau they've outgrown software and stuff that they no longer need but they haven't looked at it there's not that sort of revisiting of like what are the systems that we're currently utilizing and will they get us to the next level because it's great if they got you to where they are now but if you're mm -hmm. trying to be something other than what you currently are then you have to behave like what you want to be which means you have to up level and sort of change how you're going about doing that. Yeah, and 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 what's fascinating, what's fascinating about that as well is the fact that it, it's so easy nowadays to sign up for technologies, you know, subscription and and have loads of loads of these uh, tools. Uh, and just sign up online and you can lose track very quickly of which ones are you using, which ones are still effective, um, are they effective, oh, a shiny new toy, here's another one, like, oh, I, I should use this one. And before you know it, as you said, I mean, you're, you're, you're bleeding money out of your business through subscriptions to tools that you don't even need. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where that goes back to sort of the need for entrepreneurs or the management team, depending on the size of your company, to like, you have to be visiting the numbers again and again. Like you, it's not a set it and forget it. It's not just I look at it one time of year. It's what are the things that you're looking at? How are you analyzing the business? And that isn't just looking at the PL, which I think is oftentimes how business owners mm -hmm. look at it. That's what are the KPIs that your businesses needs to, and how are they defined such that when you look at these three, four, five metrics, they tell you the health of the business. And then they then, if it isn't looking the way you want, well, then that tells you where to start with digging in more, right? Mm -hmm. It's often very hard for businesses to find those details, those those subscriptions, when they're just looking at accounts over the cross of like this PL, right? Uh, yeah. It's much easier when you start to see relationships between, well, why is revenue growing, but expenses are like outpacing that. Okay, well, maybe we need to get a better sense of like how those are being spent or or the relationship between types of those things. So that's that's sort of like, the, it's the double-edged sword of that is not only do they increase, but so oftentimes they're hard to see once they get into your system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and it's a good point because I mean you have to kind of combine. You have to look at it from what are the things that I need and what are the things that are nice to have. And I feel oftentimes that the, I mean, and we've all been through it. It's uh, when you're maybe when you're starting your own business or something, you you get really excited about something that you think you should get it. But the reality is, you can live without that for a little bit longer. And I think that discipline part is is difficult. It is, um, you know, as business owners. Oftentimes, oftentimes entrepreneurs get into what they're doing because they're really good at what it is uh, and they, they didn't want a job anymore. Like they realize, hey, I can do this better and make more if I go out on my own. Right. And so mm -hmm. that's sort of like your guiding point. But what you forget is that when you're when you're a W2 employee or when you're working for a company, 
you're not necessarily asked to run the engine as hot as you normally would need to as the business owner entrepreneur side of things, yeah. right? This goes back to when we we're talking about like hiring maybe prematurely. Like we we view it as like, oh, this is difficult. I, let me relieve the pain and the stress of this right now by going and getting this thing to make mm -hmm. up for that. But that's problematic for a couple of reasons. Because one, the costs start right away, but the benefit does not. When you hire someone, it is not like the next day that they're going to come in and like whatever problem you had for them is going to be solved. It's often going to take weeks, months, possibly for that person to actually relieve the pressure you're talking about. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's a really, really good point because, yeah, I mean, I always say it takes about six months before you see a real impact of, yeah. of, of someone. And as you said, I mean, you can be carrying all of that expense for, for six months without, you know, getting the return that you're that you're looking for. So I think that that is that is good planning as well. And then um, when you when you work with uh, when you when you work with entrepreneurs, um, Nolan, what are, what are some other areas that you see that maybe are are easily overlooked? Yeah, you know, I think it it's it tends to be the same thing regardless of whether regardless of what type of entrepreneur they are. But I think the biggest thing is really understanding the relationships that exist within your business. And what I mean by that is the financial relationships, right? Mm -hmm. So again, talking about this from an accounting sort of perspective, I think we, we tend to over, so you can manage expenses, you can manage revenue, but if you're not managing them in relationship to each other, then you're kind of missing the big picture, right? Uh, revenue is important, but I would argue that if you generate a million dollars in revenue, but you generate a hundred thousand in profit, if the same, if I generate five hundred thousand dollars in revenue and generate a hundred thousand in profit, that's a way better scenario, right? So it isn't just in a vacuum these numbers and what they mean. It's what is the relationship between them? What is what does that tell us as we're scaling uh, about where we were and where we're trying to get to? Are we becoming more efficient? Are we becoming less efficient? And I think. The challenge oftentimes is that numbers, they are historic in most cases, right? They tell us what did happen. And the mm -hmm. best way to tell us about what is going to happen is actually using them in relation to other things, not just looking at them in a vacuum. I think that's oftentimes where entrepreneurs get themselves in trouble is they look at this number and go, oh, well, it's X. Great. I'm going to do Y. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the problem with that, though, is you've ignored all the other pieces that influenced X and may influence Y. And now you wonder why down the road, why didn't happen the way you thought it would. Yeah. And 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 I think on 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 top of that as well is is just the uh, you know, there are surprises, right? I mean, life is full of surprises. Yeah. There are there are things that are on un, unscheduled, things that you don't expect uh, to come. So you can get you can get blindsided quite easily if you're not on top of those things. And and sometimes we are we and as you said, because we're so focused on revenue and we're not thinking about the expenses, we think we're having a great month or a great quarter. And then suddenly you go, oh, where did all these expenses? Oh, I didn't realize that was coming. I didn't realize that was outgoing. Because as you said, you know, we're so focused on the revenue, we kind of just we we let the all the expenses kind of lag and just turn up. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I think one of the things that often is discounted when you're starting out and you're thinking about how you're trying to scale, right? So part of this is understanding where are you trying to get to? What is the objective? What is the next milestone? What is the next growth point? And with that understanding, what is the what is the best way of getting there, right? So there's really two, there's like three ways of growing. You can do it organically, you can do it through debt, or you can do it through investment, right? Those are kind of like the three main levers you have to scale. Organic is the best for you as a business, but it's also the hardest. Yeah. Uh, investors are great, but you have to give up control, which is hard for a lot of entrepreneurs. because That's kind of why the reason they're in business in the first place in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And that leaves us debt. Now, I think debt gets a bad name. Uh, and I think that that's something that we have to revisit as a society is like, why do you think debt is bad? Well, if you take out a line of credit or you take out a credit card or a loan and you just use it for things that don't grow or scale the business or return anything, then yeah, that's a terrible investment. You shouldn't do right. that, right? But if you're going to use it to get you to the next hurdle as a short term gap, I think that's a really important tool to have. And so you know, going back to the question of what do entrepreneurs sometimes look? Well, it's access to cash. Like how, what can you do before before you need it. Like, spoiler alert, banks don't like to give money to people who need money. Mm -hmm. But if you get it before you need the money, then it's a lot of an it's a lot easier situation when you can show a bank like, I don't need this, but can you give it to me? They're more inclined to give it to you than if you're like, hey, I am really struggling right now. My revenue doesn't look great. Well, why would I give you money if you're struggling? 
Like it's this sort of like sort of catch 22. And so I think that's the other thing that is maybe important to think about this is as you're scaling, how are you, how do you want to scale? What are you willing to give up to get to that next level? Yeah, and I think that's a that's a really, really good point that you made there is because it's a lot better to go to the bank or whatever and say, I want this extra money because I want to scale, I want to grow. Things are going great, but I want to invest and keep going. That's a great story. It's a it's a lot better story than saying, listen, I'm not going to be able to make payroll unless I have this. That doesn't right. sound like such a great uh, investment on the bank's behalf. So yeah, I I I, I totally agree agree with that. And uh and again, it, and I think also in some ways when you get into, when you start using GET instruments, and st it, is, it, it puts an, ed an additional level of discipline on you because now, I mean, let's face it, now you're not wasting your own money. You're actually wasting somebody's money who may come and take your house. <laughs> yes, that it does. It hundred percent. That is a very important factor to remember is that there is a level of responsibility that indeed doesn't exist there when you don't owe other people money. But when you do it, you know, you have, they will want their money at some point. Right. And if you mm -hmm. stop being able to pay them, well, they're going to come and take something that will give them or make them whole. Yeah. And then what about the, what about from the aspect of, uh, you know, entrepreneurs who who try to do too much and try to do all the financial stuff themselves because i mean one of the things i think you that sometimes people don't understand that somebody like yourself it isn't just going to help you with like you know the numbers or whatever but it's going to help you with financial strategies to maximize and i think i think sometimes maybe people don't understand the role that people like you play yeah, I think, you know, there's there's a way to look at numbers and there's and neither of them is necessarily wrong. It's just what are you trying to get out of it? Right. So mm -hmm. if what you need is information to be compliant, well, that's fine. Like you can hire a CPA to prepare your taxes. Yeah. You can hire a bookkeeper or an equivalent to to record the activity. But if you're what you're looking for is to actually better leverage the information and actually make it decision useful. Something I talk a lot about with clients is not using intuition all the time, but rather what does the data underlying tell us, right? You can only scale so far in intuition. It just, mm -hmm. it, there's a finite level of where you understand the business well enough for that to continue. At some point you need to rely upon the data. Now you may decide at some point that the data tells you a, but you feel differently. That's also okay. But mm -hmm. it has to be a conscious decision to deviate from the data, not just sort of like unblindly be following your gut. And so I think when you understand which of those you're looking for, then you can help find the best partner to work in that relationship with you. And I think that that's the key in all of this is to remember is what you're really then looking for is a relationship. You need this to be a partnership and that you are communicating with them. You need to understand how they're going to communicate with you. You need to define what does that role look like? What is how are we engaging with each other? What is the frequency? All of these things, they sound, oh, it's just overkill. Well, right. if any healthy relationship, look at one with your spouse or friends. Like it's all predicated on there being some sort of like agreement written or not between the two of you that this is how we're going to play together. Yeah. And this is your money at play. Why would you not want the same level of sort of like uh, uh, de definition within that relationship? So I think it's it's very critical in that piece to understand what you want, but then go find the person that can actually help you decipher the information, help make sense of it. Because again, it's really hard to be an expert at something you're not already an expert at. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's, it, it is like, if you think you're going to, if you don't have a finance or accounting background and you think you're going to be able to understand that right out of the gate, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but it's going to be very hard to get you up to speed on that. Like hire someone to help train you, educate mm -hmm. you, go yeah. along with you through the process at, so that like you, you can learn along with them. Yeah. And I think that's a critical point, as you said, there is learning along with them and an understanding rather than because let's face it. I mean, if you're not if you don't have that financial background and you don't love finance, the chances of you being really good at it out of the gate or learning it or teaching it yourself is pretty slim, to be honest. Yes. And and why wouldn't I leverage somebody like you who has like years and years of experience working with other businesses? Because obviously I would want to leverage the strategies that you've used successfully elsewhere. Yeah. Well, and, and this is a I, I want to connect this back to something we said earlier because yeah. I, I don't want your listeners to sort of think I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here, which mm -hmm. is I think it's important to understand as an entrepreneur, there are things you're great at, and then there are things that you are great at, but other people can do. And you really right. need to be honest with yourself about the difference between those things, right? Because fundamentally, you may able to be you may be able to record the transactions, but that doesn't mean that you should be. You should be yeah. able to hire someone as an expertise to go do that and then let 
that time come back to you and use it in some other area of the business that you can. Now that's not, now I know I said up front, like be careful about hiring too many people. This is different in this, my opinion, because this is you're hiring for a specific skill set, just like you would an attorney or any other professional at this point. They're going to come in at a much faster pace, pick it up better, help you scale mm -hmm. the business better. It's a very different scenario, but it's it's critical to understand that you need to be optimizing your time for what you are great at that nobody else can do. Yeah. And I think that's a that's a fantastic point about you know that you're something that you're great at, but that somebody else can do. And and as we said, it does again. It doesn't mean that you have to go out and hire somebody immediately and take on a full time employee. You can go contract somebody. You can get a fractional resource. You can do whatever. There's lots of different ways of of constructing it. But I totally agree with you. Is uh, is sometimes we do things because we can do them, but it's not the best use of our time, or maybe we like doing them. But yeah. it, but deep down, when you ask that question, honestly, is this the best use of your time? And you go, well, probably not. Yes. I mean, this is maybe not the greatest example, but like mowing your lawn. We can mm -hmm. all probably mow our lawn. Uh, is it the best use of your time? Maybe. Maybe if you want to get out of the house and not be stuck inside, maybe it's a good use of your time. But there's a lot of people you can hire to do it, including your kids, if you have them to take mm -hmm. care of that for you. And that hour, hour and a half you'd otherwise be spent outside doing that can be done. You could be spent doing something else, maybe more valuable. So yeah. do you have to you, each person has their own definition of like what is what they can and can't do. But I think it's important to understand what is the best way to use your time and, and then outsource as much other stuff as you can. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, nowadays the kids have probably outsourced that job to someone else. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. They're subcontracting that work out on top yeah, of it, right? Subcontracting, exactly. <laughs> well, listen, Nolan, this has been fantastic. All of Nolan's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah, so obviously I work in numbers. Uh, I'm a CPA by trade, although uh, I don't like to call myself that. I like to refer to myself more as uh, as an advisor for clients. Um, I, uh, I, I, my background is in psychology. So a lot of what I do with clients is helping them understand and improve the relationship with numbers as opposed to just the numbers themselves. Um, but that's sort of like my I'll say unique perspective on it is I come at it a little bit from more from an emotional, uh, mental aspect than just sort of like, here's your numbers, go deal with it. Uh, I think that people oftentimes get into a bad spot with sort of some of the traditional relationships they can have with numbers people. And that makes it harder to do. Yeah, well, yeah, it's that old thing. I mean, people think numbers are, you know, numbers are just numbers, and there's no, right. there's no emotion around that. But there's a heck of a lot of emotion around numbers. <laughs> That's <laughs> That's exactly numbers right. Themselves. Well, listen. Thanks again, Nolan. Thank you for watching and listening, and I will see you all again very soon. Thank you. Yeah.